Father in heaven, we just want to continue in the spirit of joy and worship. Pray that you would anoint this time, Father. Give us your wisdom. Give us your spirit, Lord. May we leave this place changed and renewed because of this experience. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I changed my, uh, my sermon approach for today um, based upon recent events, which happens from time to time. You kind of plan out what your thinking is weeks, maybe months, or even longer in advance. But then things happen, and you say, nope, the Lord wants me to go a different way. Long before I knew Jean was going to preach on Revelation um, and do the week of prayer on Revelation, I had also been drawn to that topic. And he actually started to preach my sermon last week. And I was sitting here kind of getting nervous. But then he just touched on it and preached three other sermons. So um, we were able to move on. <laughs> I've actually heard the book of Revelation covered in one sermon on uh, several times before, but that was the best. Pastor Sean did, John did a great job last Sabbath. And so it is by coincidence, but by providence, we might say, that God brought me to a similar uh, desire to talk on uh, the book of Revelation titled the sermon, The Last Battle. With the recent events going on in the Middle East, with the overgrowing uh, uh, challenges that are taking place in that part of the world, um, there have been many questions about what does that mean prophetically, biblically? What can we learn as a community of faith? And that's where I'm going to be going uh, today in, in my message, trying to address some basic ideas um, coming from the book of Revelation and the time in which we live. So we're going to get into this and see, um, see how we can do. I do need some help. So Toby, which ones are working here? Is red a good one? No. Red's a good one. Okay. Uh, black? Black fuzzy top? Black fuzzy top? Thank you. All right. Number one. I only have three questions, guys. So when you see number three and it's over, then, then you'll know. Now, when I'm not talking about the war in Israel right now, okay? I'm not talking about that war. I'm talking about the war, the great controversy. Who started that war? I see Andre has his hand up. And Brianna, let's give each of them a shot. Andre first. Oh, and Isaiah. Okay. Satan. Satan. What were you going to say, Isaiah? Satan. Satan. By the way, it's also Isaiah's birthday, and it's Caitlin's birthday. So this is a uh, uh, popular time uh, for birthdays. Wonderful. And there may be others out there I missed. So thank you to, to those of you who answered. We're going to go ahead and move on that. That is right. It wasn't the Lord that started it. We know it was the enemy. Do you know that we don't know his name? He has a name, but we do not know his name. His name has been restricted from knowledge. The common names that we refer to him has are titles. They are not his name. Lucifer means shining one. Devil means slanderer. Satan means adversary. Okay? His name has been stricken and just as the, the serpent was restricted to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... His name has been kept from us. And there's a reason for that. Um, the name that the Lord mostly wants associated with this enemy is liar. Liar. He is a liar. More than 20 names or identifiers are given to the enemy in the Bible. These are some of the popular ones. Here are some uh, Bible verses that talk about the Lord's desire to eliminate the names of the wicked. In the story of the Exodus, when the children of Israel rebelled, God said to Moses, let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name. Blot out their name from under heaven. And then in Psalm 9:5, you have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked and blotted out their name forever and ever. The names of the wicked will not be remembered. The names of the wicked, including whatever the name of the enemy has, will not be remembered. By the way, this is a common thing in literature today too, among fantasy themes and authors about the great enemy. They always say, oh, we don't know his name, whether it's Lord of the Rings or um, uh, uh, Beowulf or any of those ancient stories. Well, not, so, not that Tolkien is ancient, but some of these stories, they use this common theme of the name of the enemy being uh, uh, restricted. Number two, kind of general theme. We're getting close to you know Halloween and so kind of some darker uh, elements. Thank you. What does Satan want? What is, what is the war over? What is it that the enemy wants? Okay, Brianna, 
Brianna, right here, Toby, and then come up here to Julian. Do bad things. To do bad things. That's right. That's, that's absolutely right, Brianna. Julian, what does Satan want? To take over the world. To take over. Take over. Any other young people? Okay, Isaiah again. Take over us. To take over us? Yeah, he's a bad dude, isn't he? Okay. Oh, Sebastian. Or someone back there. To be God. To be God. We can say it in many different ways, but he's the classic tyrant. He's a classic usurper. He doesn't like God. He's rejected God, and he wants to do away with everything connected with God. He wants to overthrow him. He wants to destroy him, and he wants to establish himself as God. That is the idea. That is the war. That is the controversy in a nutshell. Some of the passages that are familiar with the fall of Lucifer, he said, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly. Note that idea, the mount of the assembly, in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. It's a very selfish thing. I, 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 I. It's all about me, which is what selfishness is, which is what sin is. Me, I, I'm going to do what I want. This is what drives the enemy in his war against God. It's about me, what I want, and I want to destroy what it is that God has. I will sit on the mount of the assembly. Similarly, in Ezekiel's passage, by the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence. Now, that word violence in Hebrew is the word Hamas. Hamas. In Genesis chapter 6, when God looks at the earth and it's filled with corruption, he said his heart was filled with pain because the world was filled with violence. It's the word Hamas. That is the word. Now, I'm not trying to make a prophetic thing saying that this is the Hamas of, of the Bible. It's just a, a fact. Just like, you know, President Trump wasn't the last Trump until the you know, Trump blew and you know, people try to make these uh, spiritual connections. It's just a, a reality that the Hebrew word for violence is Hamas. God continues, and you sinned. Your heart was filled with violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as profane from the, there it is again, the mountain of God. This is the enemy. Jesus said in John chapter 8, he was a murderer from the beginning. Speaking of Satan. Now, sometimes we think, well, who was the first murder? That was when Cain killed Abel. Is that the murder? But actually what Jesus is talking about here goes far beyond and before Cain and Abel. Because John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 15 says, whoever hates his brother is guilty of murder. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says the same thing. If you're angry with your brother, you have committed the sin of murder. So what, right there at the beginning in heaven, when Satan turned against Jesus, when Satan turned against the Lord, he committed murder in his heart that he finally accomplished on the cross of Calvary. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. It's from his own nature. He's a liar and the father of lies. Some people say at the temptation of Christ, when the devil came to Jesus to try to tempt him, and it says that the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and he said, I'm going to give you the whole planet if you just fall down and worship me. Some people say, why didn't the Lord do it? He could have won the war right there. If Jesus had just swallowed his integrity and said, okay, I'll go ahead and do it. Now, meet your end of the bargain. Do you think Satan would have gone, okay, you did it. I guess I'll give you all the... the... No, Satan would have laughed and said, you're, no way, you're an idiot. He's a liar. When he opens up his mouth, all he can do is tell lies. The thief comes only to still kill and destroy. These are the attributes of the enemy. Last question. For our young people, what is the last battle called in the book of Revelation? I've given you the two side letters. It starts with an A. It ends with an N. If you heard this word before, I'll give you a little bit more. It starts with arm. All right. I see Ryden and then Andre. They're probably not going to get it, though. So we've come over here. They won't. No, I'm just kidding. Armageddon. Armageddon. Did you want to say, Andre? Yeah. Same. same thing. Have you heard this word before? All right, Luca, Toby, thank you so much for being our microphone assistant. Sorry I didn't get to involve everyone. Arm again. And from the moment John the Revelator wrote the words of Revelation, and he mentioned this mysterious battle, Armageddon, Christians have been trying to understand what that means. 
What is the last battle? What is Armageddon? My focus today is to try to address three questions. One, will the war in Israel today, which by the way, is the most significant and the the most dramatic war probably since Israel became a nation in 48. It's already exceeded the 73 war. It's already exceeded the 67 war as far as the number of troops involved, the number of casualties, and the number of nations now involved. Right now, the United States is flying fighter jets over Syria. There are rebels in Yemen that are participating. There's threats being made on all sides. There's wars and rumors of wars. Is this going to become the battle of Armageddon? Number two, is modern day Israel the Israel of prophecy in the last days? Kind of a basic question. The two kind of go hand in hand. And then lastly, what is the last battle? What is Armageddon? This is easy stuff, right? Elementary, easy stuff. Very important, and it's amazing how the devil has confused this. Let's go right to the passage in Revelation 16. I'm going to be in my Bible um, uh, without the verses on the screen a little bit, but I've also put quite a bit on the screen. But have your Bibles ready um, because we're going to jump to other places. But here's the passage. Right after the sixth bowl is poured out in Revelation 16, where the great river Euphrates is dried up. Okay, this is, the, this is part of the sixth bowl or the sixth vial. Verse 13, and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. So here you have the false trinity, right? The false leaders of institutions, the false powers of the earth that are, that are uh, jockeying for dominance, cooperating together to initiate an additional false counterfeit reality in our world. Notice them out of all of their mouths comes something. We already know that the devil is a liar and anything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. So these three powers, this false trinity comes together and out of their mouth comes a frog, all right, which is just layer upon layer of, of of lies. Frogs, the weapon of a frog is in its tongue, okay? One of the fastest movements in all of nature is a frog's tongue, all right? It was after the the cursing of the Nile in Moses' day, when the Nile became blood, that after that came the plague of frogs. So frogs have always represented plague, curse, and and rejection, and, and, uh, uh, and, and here you have it also representing this layer upon layer of deception. The dragon, the beast, the false prophet. John continues, for they are the spirit of demons performing signs, performing, manifesting, orchestrating, making it real or demanding signs which go out to the kings of the whole world, the whole wide world, the WW dot world. Uh, if you don't think that the devil is going to use the internet, now I'm not saying everything on the internet is bad and wrong and of the devil, but the devil uses the world wide web to communicate his message. Does he not? How do you get your information? The news. Where does the news get it? How do you get the news? Isn't all virtually all information today contained on the internet? How is the message of the gospel going to go to the whole world? Well, he's going to use satellites and missionaries and pamphlets and all that, but he's also going to use the internet. Today is is a day when more ability to impact worldwide messaging is available to us. So the, 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 the message of the demons, the deception of the dragon goes out to the whole world, to the kings of the whole world, to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Now, right at this juncture, as John is hearing this and he's starting to get nervous because this war is so terrible, there's a parenthetical statement that the Lord gives to John where he says, behold, I'm coming like a thief. Right at this time, as this war is culminating, right when it looks like you're about to lose, right when it looks like all the world has turned against you, I am coming. I'm coming. It's going to be like a thief, not to those who are awake, not to those who are looking, not to believers. Believers will be ready and waiting and watching, but to those who aren't, There's going to be a problem. Blessed is the one who stays awake, 
keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men see his shame. And they gather them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddon or Armageddon. And then the world crashes. <laughs> How we doing, boys? And as I said earlier, it's a unique word in all the Bible and, and garners so much interest among people. So at the close of that statement comes the seventh angel who poured out his bowl upon the air. A loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. It is done. This is a description of the last battle and the last moment just before the coming of Jesus Christ and the conflict re reaches an apex with the devil. From the spirit of prophecy, there are only two parties in our world, those who are loyal to God, those who stand under the banner of the prince of darkness. Satan and his angels will come down with power and signs and lying wonders to deceive those who dwell on the earth and if possible, even the very elect. Signs, deceptions, lying wonders, deceiving, if possible, the very elect. She goes on to say, the crisis is right upon us. I wrote, it was 1899 when she wrote that. Right? The crisis is right upon us. But she simply follows in the prophetic stance of even the New Testament writers who lived in a time of presenting the idea of the culmination of the battle and the return of Christ as always being near, as always coming quickly. Revelation ends with the statement, behold, I come quickly. Now, from a human standpoint, it seems like it's been a long time. But even in our limited way, we can see how sometimes uh, time moves fast. I'm telling Betty all the time, Enjoy David's little uh, being little because you're going to blink and he's going to be a teenager. And then you're going to blink again and you're going to have grandkids. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've seen your kids grow. And it's like, how did it happen so soon? It's like, it's not been soon. Your kids are 50 years old. No, but it went by fast. From heaven's perspective, from God's perspective, these things have, have a, a more rapid course of time. But in the moment, it doesn't feel soon. But she says it here. The crisis is right upon us. It's, is this to paralyze the energies of those who have knowledge of the truth? Is the influence of the powers of deception so far reaching that the influence of the truth will be overpowered? She asks the question. The battle of Armageddon, again, is soon to be fought. He on whose vesture is written the name King of Kings, Lord of Lords, will send forth the armies of heaven on white horses, clothed in linen, clean and white, identifying, again, stay awake and keep your clothes. Another place, she says, we need to study the pouring out of the seventh vial. The powers of evil will not yield up the conflict without a struggle, but providence has a part to act in the battle of Armageddon. We are not alone. Amen? Are you with me? Going through some stuff kind of quickly, and some of it's quite significant. We know of other battles that have been waged, and Revelation talks about them. In Revelation 12, this is a previous battle. There was war in heaven. Same, same combatants here, Michael and his angels, waging war with the dragon. A very similar statement to the battle of Armageddon. You have the dragon and his institutions and powers fighting against Michael, symbolic name for Jesus, and his angels, godly angels. Satan was not strong enough. There was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. Again, deception. He was thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. Note that the works of the enemy are nearly always associated with lies, deception, counterfeits, and falsehoods. Satan is a magician, okay? He knows how to keep your attention over here so you're... Oops, sorry. So you're not looking at what's happening behind his back. You've, all, you've been to magicians before. You've seen how it works. They use sleight of hand. They use smoke and mirrors. They want your attention over here so that you don't see what's going on. Why do you think they have those skinny, cute little sidekick girls in sequin dresses out there doing stuff? It's so that you're watching them so you don't see them over here doing their magic. Okay? It's not that difficult. Satan does the same thing. He wants to deceive. And while everyone's attention seems to be drawn on one part of the earth, to a situation, what is he doing behind the scenes? 
That's the idea. War, violence, cruelty, other acts of his outrage are directed at those who reject his life and follow the truth of Jesus Christ. That is the pattern that we see in this battle with Jesus and Satan. Will the war in Israel become the battle of Armageddon? Question, is the war in Israel against Christ and his followers? No, it's not. It is a bad thing. It's a geopolitical issue. It is a historical challenge. It is something that we should be compassionate about, that we should be engaged for humanitarian purposes about, but it is not the battle of Armageddon. It will not become the battle of Armageddon. And here's the thing I like to say. As a student of history, okay, and and someone who uh, appreciates seeing how how God has worked out His acts of salvation and maintained things, if, if World War I was not Armageddon, when Turkey was ruling Palestine and Germany and they were directly affecting uh, the the Holy Lands, if that wasn't Armageddon, and if World War II wasn't Armageddon, where the the Jewish people were specifically targeted, targeted and nearly annihilated for many communities, if that wasn't Armageddon, this is not Armageddon either. It is not a direct assault against God and God's believing community. Now, you have some questions? We'll see if we can address some of them as we move along here. Is modern day Israel the Israel of prophecy in the last days? Is there a, are they kind of? Are they sort of? Are they maybe? You do have references to Jews and the temple, and circumcision, and all those things throughout the New Testament. Here in Revelation, you have this one statement, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. What is that? Who is that? Is that the ethnic people that have the, the, the genetic bloodline going back to Abraham? What does that mean? Well, a little history lesson for you. The rise of Christian Zionism. Now, Jewish Zionism is, is simply the Jews wanting to establish a new state and establish the temple and all that. That's what Jewish Zionism is. Christian Zionism is saying, yes, we want the Jews to do that because the Messiah has to come through the modern state of Israel. This is where Jean started getting into it last week. Much of American support of Israel today is not because we are, and I want to be generous here, I mean, I know that we have general desire for peace and tranquility in the earth. But much of Western Christian support of Israel is not just altruistic desire that Israel be a peaceful state, but it's because much of Christianity believes that the Messiah can only come through the modern state of Israel. So we must support them because they have to build a temple, because the man of sin has to appear in the temple, and Jesus Christ must come to the literal temple. Remember what the devil does? Sleight of hand. He has you looking at this over here, so you're not looking at what's going on back here. Where did that come from? Up until the 19th century, most of Christianity, Catholic and Protestant both, believed in what's called replacement theology. To one degree or another, this teaches that the New Testament church now replaces the covenant relationship with God once reserved for the Jewish nation. In other words, up until the 19th century, for the most part, Christians, when they would be reading the Bible, when they would come across in the New Testament or in prophecy the term Israel, they would say, well, that means the church. Or when they would come across the term Jew, they would say, well, that's the believing Christian. Or when they would come across the word temple, Paul says that you corporately are the body or the temple of Jesus Christ. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So they said, that's the church. That's the body of Christ. Circumcision in the New Testament, Paul makes it very clear. Circumcision is an evidence of faith or is faith in the heart. This is what was commonly understood up until the rise of the isms. The isms. The 19th century was the period of isms. Communism, Darwinism, spiritualism, Adventism, dispensationalism, futurism, preterism, millerism, millennialism, industrialism. Brendan, earlier than you left. I mean, every generation has its isms, but these isms sprang to life in the 19th century. And some of them, had extraordinarily had extraordinary effect on the Christian interpretation of Israel, particularly dispensationalism and futurism. Now, we're going to spend about an hour right now going through what those mean. No, we're not going to do that. But what it did is it introduced a reinterpretation of the reality of what Israel is in prophecy. 
And this, in the 19th century, this got very little traction because there were almost no Jews living. The Ottoman Empire ruled in the 19th century. The Ottoman Empire, Turkey, okay, ruled Palestine, and there were about a thousand Jews. They regulated the number of Jews that were allowed to live in, in Palestine. They didn't even call it Palestine. They called it the Holy Land. Um, and there were almost no Jews living there or even wanted to live there. But then something happened at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. By the 20th century, many Christians had accepted some form of Christian Zionism. They began to change their idea. Well, maybe, maybe Israel doesn't just mean the church. Maybe there does need to be a national state. Maybe God does want to reestablish His old covenant relationship with the people of Israel. Maybe we do need to start interpreting Israel as a geopolitical state. This was still a minority, though. Very few believed. Catholics did not believe this on whole. Uh, m- many Protestants didn't. Just a few of these pesky dispensational futurists did. And then 1948 happened. Lo and behold, for the first time in 2,000 years, there was now a geopolitical state called Israel. And there's drama and history and all kinds of things related to how this took place in 1948. This gave ammo to the dispensationalists. This gave a a foundation for them to say, see, see, we told you. We We don't need to spiritualize Israel. We don't need to replace it with the church. We now see that there is a geopolitical nation called Israel. Hebrew speaking Jews now occupy that place. And so now we can see that it's true that Israel will be the prophetic fulfillment of Revelation. And, 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 and then all of this begins to filter in to the Christian church, even into Adventism. Forms of Christian Zionism will come into the Adventist church. But what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? In Daniel chapter 9, Vanessa, where are you? <laughs> We're just talking to me about this this morning. Okay, I can't do the whole thing. It's too much. All right, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel is living in Babylon. Israel is no more. Israel had been wiped out. If you remember your history in your Bible, there is no temple. Daniel and the Jews are living as captives. And Daniel begins to wonder and worry about the future of his people. And in Daniel chapter 9 and in previous chapters, God gives to Daniel a prophecy. Turn in your Bibles if you would like. We're not going to read the whole thing. There's just too much. But we're going to touch on the highlights. Right after Ezekiel, you'll find the little book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Notice what God says to Daniel. Seventy weeks, seventy sevens, seventy prophetic time periods have been decreed for your people, your city, to finish transgression, make an end to sin, make atonement for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal of vision, prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now this is significant because when the Lord gives this vision to Daniel, there is no most holy. The temple had been destroyed. There is no most holy place. But here he says, I'm giving you a time period of probation for your people and the old covenant relationship that we have with them. I'm giving 70 prophetic set time periods of seven weeks or 490 years. 490 years is what I'm giving to the Jewish nation to see if you can become reestablished as the covenant people. And he goes on to describe the events that would take place down to verse 27. The prince of the people who is to come, the Messiah, he will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of that week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even to a complete destruction until it is decreed and poured out on the one who makes desolate. So I know I'm going through this quickly, but God makes it very clear in Daniel, I am giving the Jewish people, the covenant people, a limited time period to reestablish their relationship with me. If they fail in that, he uses the word desolate. They will become desolate. Do you notice that? Skip forward now to Mark chapter 1. Jesus comes on the scene. In Mark chapter 1, verse 9, he's baptized. The Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus at his baptism. He becomes the anointed one. He becomes the Messiah. Beginning the last week of prophecy, 483 years have gone by, and we're now in the last seven-year period of this prophecy. 
Jesus comes in as the Messiah. And the first words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, is the time is fulfilled. He's speaking right to Daniel's prophecy. He says, this is it. This is it. This is the final chance. He even tells his disciples, do not go to the Gentiles. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. My job right now is to try to reestablish the covenant relationship with Israel to see if they might possibly accept me as the Messiah and become once more the people that I want them to be. Did they succeed? They did not. So in Matthew chapter 23, in verse 37, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers chicks under its wings. But you were unwilling. You stoned those who are sent to her, and you kill the prophets who are sent to you. Your house is left unto you desolate, he says in Matthew 23. Speaking right to the prophecy of Daniel, the time is fulfilled. You have rejected the Messiah and the house of Israel. The national, ethnic, old covenant relationship has now become desolate. And then he references Daniel in Matthew 24 as the abomination of desolation. I know I'm going through this fast. Sula, are we together? Do you need to get notes out? Write it down. We'll talk later if you need. Okay. And then we all know what happens in Matthew 27. Jesus dies on the cross. And what happens to the veil? The veil is ripped from top to bottom. The old institutional work of the, of the Jewish nation is eliminated. So halfway, this is three and a half years from his baptism, three and a half years into that 70th week of Daniel, exactly what Daniel said would happen. In the midst of the week, sacrifices are put to an end. Jesus dies. But yet there was even additional time left, even though they had, Jesus had died, there was still a time period left for the Jews to say, well, maybe we had this wrong. At Pentecost, Jesus, or excuse me, at Pentecost, Peter speaks to the crowds there in Jerusalem and many are baptized. And the Jewish nation has one more brief opportunity to change their mind up until the stoning of Stephen. Now, if you've never seen this before, I want you to see it in your Bibles. Acts chapter 7, it's Acts chapter 6 and 7 actually. You need to see it because this is the end of, of the 70-week prophecy, and it shows it so dramatically. At the end of chapter 6, Stephen has been arrested, and it says, they fixing their gaze on him. This is Acts 6.15. All who are sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Stephen is brought before the Supreme Court of Israel. He is brought before the Sanhedrin. This is now the supreme leadership of Israel. And he begins to speak to them about all the works of salvation that God has done, bringing up to the point of introducing the Messiah. He preaches this massive sermon explaining how God had been trying to get their attention. And when he gets to the end of the sermon, does the Sanhedrin go, we believe, we believe, Stephen? No. Notice what it says. Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. You, this is Stephen talking. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Now down to verse 55. Notice Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit. Being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of the Lord and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Stephen, filled with the Spirit of God, all right, is now before them. And he says in verse 56, I see the... Heaven's open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and they covered their ears and rushed at him. Who are they covering their ears to? Not just Stephen, but the Holy Spirit that was in Stephen. This was the final rejection of the Jewish nation to the message of Jesus Christ. This is the end of Daniel's prophecy and the end of the old covenant relationship. Israel is no longer, as of this point, the literal geopolitical people that is a fulfillment of prophecy. Notice too, Stephen says he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Okay, This is not uh, insignificant. Every time Jesus is described by the Father, he's always seated. He says soon after you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. I go up to, to heaven to be with my Father, to be seated with Him. 
This is the one time Jesus is described as standing. Why? Because it was a scene of judgment. Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man coming, standing before the Ancient of Days. In Daniel chapter 11, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 12, it talks about Michael arising. Michael stood on behalf of his people. It is a significant time of Jesus himself standing and saying, this is now ended. Judgment is over. And right after that, the message of the gospel goes to the Gentiles. So from the New Testament perspective, Paul says he's not a Jew who is one outwardly. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is out of the heart. I'm a Jew today. I'm a Jew. And if you love Jesus Christ, you are too. When Jacob had his name changed to Israel in the Old Testament, the very first person to be called Israel, it was at his conversion. It was when Jacob wrestled with God and when he held on to God and says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And the angel who was the Lord said, okay, I will bless you. I'm changing your name. Your name is now Israel. The very term Israel means a converted individual. That's how it started. This wasn't a major change from God. This is not dispensationalism where God worked a certain way with Israel and then said, well, that didn't work. I guess I need to try something else. It had always been God's plan that Israel, Jew, had always referred to someone having faith in God. It is not though as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Any of you grow up in church going, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons. Had... We need to listen. Let's stand up and do it. No, don't. Do it. Okay, but you remember how the song goes? I am one of them, and so are you. We've been teaching our children to sing this, and we sometimes. I grew up in a church that believed in dispensationalism, and here I am in Sunday school going, Father Abraham, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. And yet my very church in faith was like, No, you're not. Sometimes we don't realize the insanity we have within our own structure. Of course, I don't have that, but maybe you do. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's descendants according to promise, heirs according to promise. Those who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Is modern day Israel, the nation state, are they fulfillment of the Israel of Bible prophecy in the last days? No, friend. Dear friend, no, they are not. The devil would love it for you to believe that because he gets your attention over here and says, look over here, look what's going on over here. And then you don't see what he's doing back here. And back here is Armageddon. Back here is the real battle. Again, nothing to say about not wanting to have compassion and generosity and peace for any conflict that's happening on the world. But the devil is more concerned about what's happening back here. New Covenant Christians are Israel. Last question. So then what is the last battle? What is Armageddon? I want to tell you something right here at the outset. Most of the commentaries you read will say that Armageddon is a Jewish term for the mountain of Megiddo. Okay, how many of you heard that before? Armageddon is the mountain of Megiddo. Most, including the Adventist commentary, lists that as a possible definition. I think that is not close to being accurate. Never in the Bible is Megiddo called Mount Megiddo. As a matter of fact, there is no Mount Megiddo. It's actually the plain. It's a flat area. It's literally not a mountain. Etymology, also, there's problems in how we interpret prophecy and symbolism. It is not an accurate description. It was Satan who wanted to take over the mountain of God, though. And it is believers who are planted on the rock of Jesus Christ that Satan wants to take over. I think Armageddon is a spiritual reference to those who are standing on the mountain of Jesus Christ. Anyways, that was bonus. That was for free. Notice what John says. They are the spirits of demons manifesting, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. El Shaddai, by the way. We sing God Almighty in our song. God Almighty, right? That's El Shaddai. You gather them together of the war of the great day. Now, some of your Bibles, 
say on the great day. It is not on though. It is of. It is the genitive case. It is teis hameras, teis megalos tutheo. Okay? It is of the great day of God. So here's a question for you. What is the great day of God? What is the great day of God? There's a double meaning to this. Isaiah tells us, if because of the Sabbath, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on whose holy day? What is the great day of God? What is the war that Satan has against God and the great day of God? If you call the Sabbath the delight, a holy day to the Lord, honorable, honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord. The battle of Armageddon is Satan's war against the Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath, and those who honor the Sabbath. That is the great battle of Armageddon, friends. Yes, there's more to it than that, but all throughout Scripture, God defines what His day is. And that day has caused consternation to the enemy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The revelation vision was given on the Lord's day. It was on the Lord's day that John gets the vision, and the battle of Armageddon is against the Lord's day. It is when the culmination of all powers of the earth confront and reject and attack the character of God that's found in His law and those who uphold His character. In Revelation, the number 7 appears 55 times in 31 verses. Over and over and over, it's the seventh this, the seventh that, the seventh this. Remember the, the number of the, the, the man of sin? The, the number of the Antichrist? What number is it? Six, six. Six, it's the repetition of six. The number of God is the repetition of seven. The very first time seven is repeated is in Genesis chapter two, when it says on the seventh day, God completed his work and God rested on the seventh day. And then God blessed the seventh day. The seventh day is repeated. That's the first time a number is repeated in all the Bible. And it's seventh day, seventh day, seventh day. And throughout the book of Revelation, 55 times, seven, seven, seven. In Revelation 12, 17, the remnant will be those who keep the commandments. In Revelation 14, 12, the saints will be those who keep the commandments. And then right in between those, in Revelation 14, 7, you got the cookie, right? You got the Oreo. You got the, the crunchy cookie on top. And then you got the crunchy cookie on the bottom. But what's the part of the cookie everybody wants? It's the creamy, gooey, maltodextrin, goofy stuff that that is. Right? I don't even know what it is, but that's what you want. You want the cream. So you've got the commandment keepers on one side. You've got the commandment keepers on the other side. And then right in the middle, you have the Sabbath command directly quoted in the first angel's message. Worship Him! The, the angel that holds the everlasting gospel crying out to the earth. Worship Him who made the heaven, the sea, and the earth and everything that's in them. Directly quoting from the Sabbath command. You shall observe the Sabbath for the Lord God made the heavens, the earth, and the sea but rested on the seventh day. In Revelation 16, 14, the war of the great day of God. And then in two places, it talks about the redeemed being sealed with the seal of God. What is the seal of God? Why does Satan hate those who honor the Sabbath? Because God says it's the Sabbath that shows our love and fidelity to God. You shall surely observe my Sabbath. This is a sign this is a seal. This is a token. This is a mark. This is what sets you apart from the world. By, having an, by observing the reality and the spiritual force of the Sabbath, it is a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Every time you honor God's Sabbath day, you're telling the devil, no. No, it's God who sanctifies me. Every time you keep the Sabbath, you're saying, I want to live by God's character. Every time you keep the Sabbath, you're saying, I want the Spirit of God in my life. 
and you reject the lies of the devil. He goes on to say in Exodus or in Ezekiel 20, another one, sanctify my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign. Remember what it is that the, the uh, false trinity brings upon the earth there in Revelation 16? It says that they perform signs. They manifest signs. They have their false signs, their false tokens, their false marks, their false symbols. And God says, I have a true symbol. And it's my day that I have given you. My Sabbaths are the sign that you are allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you. Satan has a false sign in Revelation. Scripture is clear what God's true sign is for his people. The Bible upholds the law of God as the defining attributes of those who are saved from sin and Satan. By grace through faith, we claim the righteousness of Christ, while the Spirit of God daily transforms our sinful nature into his glorious character. This cannot happen if we are living in open rebellion to God's law. It's not the law that saves us. It's Jesus Christ who saves us. But out of that salvation experience, out of joy for God's salvation, we want to live according to His character. All ten laws of the Decalogue are unique and have special significance. But at the heart of God's law is the Sabbath. The the Sabbath stands alone as the outward expression of faith in Christ and the rejection of the satanic lies. Every Sabbath we celebrate the true Trinity, God who created us, Christ who saves us, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Against such demonstrations of power and hope, the devil rages and wages war. Armageddon may truly involve real geopolitical warfare, but it will not be over territorial disputes, blood feuds, or long-standing ethnic religious bigotry. Those have always been part of our world. All the world will unite in opposition to Christ to the Lord and to his followers who faithfully stand for his law, his Sabbath, and his salvation. That is the last battle. That is Armageddon. Could some of these other regional things develop into the more spiritual reality of the world uniting against his people? Maybe, but it hasn't happened yet. from the great controversy. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. It is the point of truth, especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that's in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receives the mark of the beast, others choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority receive the seal of God. Be watchful. Be awake. Study your scriptures. Study the prophecies. And be aware of what's happening in our world. But don't let Satan distract you, friend. Don't begin to turn one battle into the last battle that is not it. Because while you're focusing on that, the devil's working out something behind the scenes. He overcomes, will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. The wicked's names will be erased. Those who overcome, those who receive the righteousness of Christ, clothed in white garments, I will not erase his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Pray for peace. Pray for the suffering. Be activists for humanitarian reasons. Yes, we want to see harmony. We want to see relief. But don't be deceived. That is not Armageddon. Satan cares a lot more about what we do in this church today than he cares about geopolitical squabbles. We stand representing faith in Jesus Christ. Don't take that the wrong way. He cares about all the suffering. But he's watching, and he wants his church watching as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have so much more to learn and grow and and develop in our understanding of these things. But Father, help us not to be 
deceived. Help us not to be distracted. Help us to stand on the foundation of the clarity of Your Word. And You have given us so much strength and wisdom and insight, Father. We really have no excuse. But we need to be reminded, Father, we are still learning. We, 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 we do get our attentions drawn to one side or the other. But God, help us to remain rooted in our relationship with You. Thank You so much for not leaving us in the dark. Thank You for being the light. And Father, please protect us. And Lord, we do lift up all of the challenges in the world. Ukraine, Israel, even the suffering happening in inner cities, even right here in Phoenix. Father, we know it hurts your heart. And that's why we look forward to your soon return. When all these things will be done away with, help us to keep our eyes looking up. We pray in Jesus' name.